the patient may present to you is like you know be having shortness of breath at rest or sometimes it will be shortness of breath on exertion so their excess tolerance is drastically uh, reduced and they are not able to find, maintain their uh, or like their, it affects their activities of daily living as well they tend to have noisy breathing so it could be like a bees or it could be like a audible crackles like you know you can feel the patient when they're saying or when they're talking to you they can you can see like you know they tend to have a lot of audible crackles they tend to have very fast and shallow breaths so like you know like uh, because of the labor breathing so they don't tend to ventilate the base of the lung so there are higher chances of getting collapsed at the bottom of the lung so you have to encourage a lot of uh, deep breathing exercise for these particular patients their heart rate is increased and they also tend to uh, have a bit of a sinuses on peripheral sinuses and sometimes on central sinuses as well and their skins are quite cold and clampy and they tend to use their accessory muscles for respiration and the other thing is like because of uh, feeling quite breathless they are, their anxiety levels also affected and they look very anxious and they have uh, frequently they have, they have a lot of panic attacks So when it comes to assessment, like the first thing what I would do, I mean, the main thing is like, you know, um, I added a bit of an early warning score system, but it depends upon where and which uh, um, area you work. For example, if you're working in acute trust and if someone is presenting like that, then you tend to do a full general examination. Like you now you do a general examination wherever you are, like in a general uh, acute or in the community or in any sort of bedded units. Um, you check for instance of heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen, saturation, temperature, BP, check how they are, whether they are alert uh, or they're um, getting uh, like, you know, whether they're alert or responding to voice and those sort of things. If you know, acute trust, immediately after operation, something like that, when you're visiting the patient to check them and if they're not like, you know, looking all right, then fill the early morning score and escalate the care. Uh, if it happens in the community, always, um, uh, like you, you take the responsibility and then you have to uh, contact the patient's GP or uh, local team, like, you know, his medical team. Um, always use a validated tool to measure the breathlessness, like board scale. So that helps to uh, measure whether there's any improvement or deterioration of patient condition with the treatment. And also check what patient's knowledge on self-management. So, for example, a lot of patients tend to, I mean, it's not like, you know, um, during the pre-op, we tend to discuss to them, like, you, know, you give a lot of advice about how to control the uh, breathlessness, uh, relaxation techniques, all those things. Check what is the knowledge, whether it has gone in the wind, they still remember, or whether they have any sort of patient resources. Normally, like, you know, it's very difficult, like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big thing for them. Like, you know, it's a big, it has a, when they have a diagnosis of cancer, it, it, it impacts a lot of things, like, you know, their uh, economic status, uh, like the mental health, a lot of things. So they tend to forget a lot of things. So it's always better to give some sort of patient information leaflets so they can uh, ass have access to them. So check about their patient knowledge and capacity of self-assessment, whether they can manage themselves or whether they need any sort of help. Um, check for the uh, severity of the breathlessness and check when it happens, the frequency and the onset and time as well. This is very important to see whether it's due to uh, any sort of triggering factors, like a lot of things will happen. So check whether, how, when, where, and what brings in. And also check for instead of uh, aggravating and reducing factors. Look for any sort of contributory factors. So pain can be the main issue, sometimes pain or sometimes retained secretion. So these are the two main things which can uh, lead to breathlessness. So check for those things. Uh, always check for the pain uh, levels. So if the pain is the main issue, then uh, check which, uh, pain, I mean, uh, what medication take for pain management. If they need increasing on the ladder, always contact the patient GP or patient oncologist and see whether uh, anything could be added to it. It is also very important to assess this func uh, patient's functional and psychological uh, impact. So some patients, because of the breathlessness, what happens that has uh, impact on their mobility. So because of the mobility, um, they find a bit awkward. Or to, I mean, a lot of patients, what I've seen is like, they don't feel comfortable using that commode or uh, like, you know, they don't like to use a commode in the living room and then they always prefer walking to the uh, toilet. And uh, because they have, because of the breathlessness, uh, 
they have difficulty walking. So because they have difficulty walking, they tend to take less nutrition because like they want to avoid walking to the toilet and that will have a lot of effect on their uh, physical health that can lead to a lot of other things like fatigue and a lot of things. So it's always better to check the functional and the physical impact of breathlessness. Very important thing is like uh, inhaler techniques. So um, if they started on insert inhaler, check for the techniques. So normally if they don't uh, seal the mouth of the inhalers properly, then it's not effective. So it's not going to address their uh, breathlessness if it's caused due to bees. Um, always assess and score activities of daily living and patient current problems. So we need a bit of a documentation so that we can revisit and see whether uh, it always helps to compare uh, the effectiveness of the treatment. So how do we manage the breathlessness? It's nothing new, it's all what we know before. It's main thing is relaxation techniques. So show them uh, all the uh, appropriate uh, ways to relax. A uh, lot of patients, what, how they, what they, I mean, their main complaint is like they feel quite breathless when they are having their dinner or lunch. So that's where like, you know, there's too much of uh, activity or uh, workload happening and they tend to get a bit anxious because they can't, like, you know, they, they can't uh, carry out uh, their um, intake. Teach them um, breathing control techniques or breathing training, like, like post leg training and diaphragmatic breathing. Advise them on pacing and prioritizing and planning. That is very important. Uh, so for one example for this one, it's like you can always pace them, like you know, rather waiting if their patient has to use the toilet or something like that, ask them to pace it, uh, time it, like, you know, and have a chat in between the distance so that they can take some rest and then continue the journey and tell them not to wait till the end to use the toilet. So they're going to get uh, anxious and then it's, they're going to feel more breathlessness. I mean, it's going to worsen the symptom. Help them to clear the chest. So ACBT is a technique what we follow here, uh, which is uh, the ACBT stands for Active Cycle Breathing Technique. And mm -hmm. what I've done is like, uh, this is what we normally do. So it's a breathing control followed by three to five deep breath. Again, a breathing control followed by a huffing. When I say huffing, it's like how you steam the glass like this. <gasps> so you tend to do the patient and then a breathing control followed by a cough to clear the phlegm. So this is a very, uh, this is a very effective way of clearing their uh, uh, secretion without uh, like you know, too much effort. I've added the YouTube link as well. It's one of the uh, NHS Scotland uh, respiratory physios demonstrating or not uh, like one of the patients is demonstrating how to do uh, ACBT technique. So it's a very good video to watch. And um, the other way to overcome the breathlessness is like increase the airflow. So when I say increase the airflow, it's like tend to use uh, you, uh, use fan. Okay, so it helps with like uh, like uh, I don't know, it, it's quite effective to uh, help with breathing. Like how we have the uh, like always like um, we have other assisted uh, ways of uh, helping like uh, feedback all those things. But like you know for uh, increasing airflows, using the fan is the first step. Try that one. And pulmonary rehabilitation, if they're appropriate, uh, if they're not uh, appropriate, please do not do that. And then refer as appropriate. Like when I say refer as appropriate, it's a, it's, it's a fine line because cancer rehabilitation is a multidisciplinary working. So you do a holistic approach. You see other, uh, like, you know, you assess for patient for everything, but there's a very fine line with uh, maintaining a professional boundary. That's very important. So. Uh, Imagine if the patient is uh, having difficult, like if you're checking the patient on inhaler techniques, if it's not doing properly, then you have to uh, alert the uh, respiratory nurse and they can teach them and then they can show, check on the uh, um, technique. And if the patient has difficulty, that's a lot of, like if you see an inhaler, they, there could be a lot of uh, difficulty faced by patients. If they're elderly, if they have any sort of arthritis in the hands, uh, they won't be able to use the um, inhalers properly. So for them, they need something like the like uh, or, uh, triggered uh, inhalers, those sort of things. So always record the appropriate uh, specialty for that. So respiratory nurse and and if you think like the patient ha is quite breathless and can't walk to the toilet properly or like you know it is uh, working her out and she's feeling too anxious about it, always refer to occupational therapist. Uh, plan like uh, advice for. Um, 
like uh, you know advice for um, bercetamol or like you know those things and if the patient finds difficulty managing stairs and all those things try to uh, refer for uh, extra banister on the sides which might help with them to um, pace uh, or ask for um, stair lift the next common one is fatigue so cancer related fatigue is a very complex but a very common symptom so the main uh, symptoms of fatigue is lack of energy. Uh, they have the difficulty of sleeping, either they sleep too much or they don't have any energy to wake up in the morning or they, uh, they don't find, I mean, they find very hard to sleep. Uh, they feel very anxious, sad or depressed. They tend to have myalgia, like pain in the muscles. Uh, they have lack, they have, I mean, they lack uh, concentration. They can't focus on anything, it's like like whether they say tend to get too bored, they can't focus on um, television or anything, or reading books or solving the crosswords, they can't do those things. And they also lack with the decision making skills because of the concentration levels. And they don't, I mean, they, lo they lose interest with a lot of things. So it's always worth checking the patient, like, you know, whether, uh, whether there's any sort of recent change uh, in their interest. And also, they tend to have a lot of negative thoughts. That's very important. If that's the case, you have to be very careful. Check whether they have any sort of imminent uh, self-harming thoughts. If that's the case, always alert the mental health team. Um, so that's your responsibility. So how do you assess? So um, always like uh, check for the pattern, including the onset and duration. Check for patient's sleep, nutrition, and um, daily living activities like whether they're physically active or they're just becoming a very more of a sedentary lifestyle um you and also use some sort of standardized tool like fatigue severity scale scale like fss it's always better to compare after a period like you know you can see whether the patient is deteriorating uh, or is showing signs of improvement so it's important very important to uh, use standardized tool so that we can always compare and uh, check for the pain levels. So pain could be one of the reasons as well. And look for the medication history. So when they're in a lot of, uh, like, you know, if, for pain medication wise, if they're in a lot of opiates and all those things, that may make them too drowsy and like, you know, they may feel very uh, sleepy, all those things. Check for the mood, that's very important. So uh, any patient with a recent diagnosis of cancer, it has a high impact on the, uh, I mean, in their mental well-being. So they have changes in the mood. And uh, it also costs their family life. So that can have impact on their um, mental status, which can lead to fatigue and social history. So we we'll see whether they have any problem with the family or friends, whether they're meeting the friends or they're going out, that they're socializing themselves. Check all those things. And how do you manage from physio point of it? So from the physio point of it, always set uh, a realistic goals. So when it comes to rehabilitation, it's always a patient-centered goal, and it has to be like, you know, you have to involve patient in everything. Again, you have to be, it's going to be very realistic. If you think the patient can't, uh, like, you know, uh, if he says like, uh, I want to go for running in another six weeks, no. So you have to be very realistic and say, you know, you have to, you can only progress slowly. So you have to be very realistic on the goals. Teach them a lot of uh, relaxation techniques, and it's always effective to uh, introduce mild to moderate intensity exercises, especially like uh, cardiovascular work and targeted strengthening exercises. And also it's very important to pace the uh, treatment uh, according to their, uh, because if you see on the initial slide, uh, I did uh, mention that you have to check the pattern, the onset and duration. So it's always very important to pace your exercises um, on, not on those periods where you feel very tired, so you can pace uh, on other times. And follow five P's for energy conservation. So the five P's are plan. You have to plan, pace, prioritize. See what is needed to do first. And posh is very important. And the last one is permission. So when it's a permission, what it means like, you know, see whether you have to do it. If not, always ask someone to help you. So command or demand others to do it. So by then you can save your energy for, main, uh, for important things, for exercise and other things. The, the, other, the third common one is pain. So I'm going to discuss about MSK pain, okay? So um, MSK problem can occur either related to cancer 
or unrelated to cancer. Okay, so when you say unrelated cancer is like imagine if uh, some patient has a like a breast cancer or something like that, or any sort of ovarian cancer or something like that, and after the chemotherapy, all those things, which is quite elderly, and if there's a period of immobilization or something, then arthritis is going to kick in. So it could be unrelated to cancer as well. So uh, consider the following three components when it comes to uh, pain assessment. So always check for the description of the pain, see what type of pain, how it is, and check for the response. Um, how whether it is there any sort of um, factor which makes it better, and see how it impacts the patient lifestyle or emotional status. That's very important. And always uh, follow the. Um, I mean, we all do follow it, like you know, like Socrates, sight, onset, character, all those things. And consider the physical fitness and quality of life of the patient as well. And the last but the uh, very important one is please check for the red flags. Uh, I have a very important slide in uh, at the end of this uh, uh, presentation. So uh, please check for the red flags. That's very important. So how do we manage uh, MSK pain? It's always by therapeutic exercises, as you see fit. Always uh, plan as a sedated and purposeful activity. Postural re-education is very important. Tense is quite effective, so you can give tense. But again, remember, no other alcohol mortalities are generally uh, used. It's contraindicated for the primary or secondary cancer sites. So you can't use any sort of alcohol mortalities on the uh, cancer site, whether it's primary or secondary. Um, cold and hot therapy, uh, you can use like uh, heat and cold therapies and provide orthosis if you think it is uh, necessary. And offer complementary and alternative medicine if you're qualified, uh, like acupuncture, which uh, I think like, uh, I mean, here a lot of physios who, tra who are trained uh, have to maintain the um, sufficient uh, uh, like hours of uh, CPDs to practice. One of the other important one is continence. So uh, if you see any sort of cancer or any intervention for urological, gynecological and process surgeries to pelvic area are more likely to affect the urinary con control. And surgeries affecting the anal splinter or bubble can uh, may affect a fecal continence. And in UK, prostate cancer in men is uh, like it's the most common one here. So, so the physio for incontinence, again, it's a very specialist uh, uh, field and uh, we have physios and we do refer them to the uh, incontinence team uh, department or like continence uh, physio uh, referral. So they always uh, have one-to-one -one session and their main aim of the treatment is to address the uh, UTI symptoms and the frequency and the urgency. And they, have, they everyone has started on Kegel exercise, like mainly like in a pelvic floor strengthening once and uh, bladder training. So this is very important. When it comes to bladder training, you tend to, uh, they advise the patient uh, to, uh, they teach them how to delay the urination so that they don't, they don't like, you know, there are three components when it comes to bladder training. First one is uh, learning to delay urination. The second one is timed voiding. So you tend to see the patient maintain a timetable, like, you know, just say use I have to go to the loo at uh, 10 o'clock, and the next one should be at uh, 1 o'clock, and the other one should be at 4. So, time voiding. And the third one is like managing fluid intake and diet. So, when it says managing fluid intake, yes, they have to take the uh, normal recommended uh, level of uh, fluid intake, but any sort of excess we, we in the basement avoid. One of the other symptoms is lymph uh, lymphedema. So uh, it is caused due to the uh, damage to the lymphatic system. Uh, it mostly occurs, or you can see that one in the arms and in the legs, but it can also affect the genitals or the head and the neck region. Uh, it causes discomfort because of the uh, pressure on the skin. Uh, there's a reduced function because of the uh, swelling and uh, they can't move because it's quite heavy. And it also impacts the mobility and because uh, impacts mobility and the main thing is like you know it also causes some sort of infections mainly the cellulitis that's the bacterial infection of the skin so they have recurrent infections like cellulitis uh, so uh, it, 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 you have to treat them like you know it uh, tends to get progressive and may cause uh, uh, tissue damage if, if it's left untreated so it's always important and good practice to measure pre and post-op 
lymph volume to um, for early diagnosis. So, for example, if someone had a bit of a breast cancer and the lymph nodes on the axillus were removed, it's always better to check the uh, lymph gland pre-op and post-op to see whether there's any sort of a change. Because in the next slide, you can see the diagram like different stages. I think uh, it's cut short. Uh, okay, so normally what happens is, uh, for example, if you see the stage two, uh, it's very hard to uh, differentiate which side is affected. But if it's gone to further, like four, you can see like your left, the patient's left side is affected. But if you see on the stage one and stage two, it's quite difficult to uh, visually uh, diagnose that the patient has the lymphedema rather than to, like you know you know the exact uh, um, measurement pre and post op. So lymphedema, again, is one of the specialist field of uh, physio and a lot of uh, people who um, they work only on lymphedema uh, department and uh, we tend to refer them and uh, they follow the following therapy for lymphedema, which is the uh, decongestive uh, lymphatic therapy, which has four components. So the first one is compressure bandage. So on this diagram, you can see how the, um, uh, like you know, it's quite a bit of a designer uh, bandaging but normally you can see like in it's like a skin color uh, bandage elastic bandage we tend to give them uh, so that is to complement exercise by moving flu uh, fluid out of the affected limb and to minimize further buildup the second one is skin care so because of the uh, stretching and uh, constant use of the um, elastic uh, bandage it might irritate the skin so you have to make sure you need to give a good patient advice to uh, moisture the skin remove it and uh, make sure you dry it so it, it's not quite sweaty all those things you have to just make sure uh, it doesn't lead to any sort of skin infection so skin hygiene is very important as well and the third one is exercises so some sort of circulatory exercises position the arm like lifting it up and like you know rather having a like raising and when you're watching telly or something ask them to raise over the shoulder level so that your age with the gravity helps with uh, uh, circulation and uh, they follow a very specialist uh, massage technique which is known as manual lymphatic drainage which stimulate the flow of fluid into the lymphatic system. Very common one. The next one is peripheral neuropathy. So uh, the causes for peri uh, peripheral neuropathy in cancer uh, could be due to a lot of uh, due to uh, cancer medication, especially if it's of platinum based or uh, accents or vinca alkaloids, uh, or sometimes with the tumor growing close to the nerve. For example, if they have any sort of sarcomas, which is mainly, as I told you initially, could be due to the uh, connective tissue or all those things. If it's near to the head of fibula, then it can uh, cause a stretch on the common perineal nerve and the patient can present with some sort of a foot drop. And uh, sometimes it can also due to uh, surgery or, or radiotherapy or paralyplastic syndrome, which I already explained previously, like it is the, uh, like, you know, uh, the piece of, um, like, you know, rather uh, identify the cancer it also uh, affects the uh, cells of the nervous system. Symptom, they'll have alter sensation, pain, muscle weakness. Um, if it affects the autonomic nervous system, they tend to present with constipation, feeling bloated. They also tend to have a bit of a hyper, a postural hypertension, uh, once again, because of ANS. And they also have difficulty with the fine motor skills. So these sort of patients, they tend to uh, complain. They struggle buttoning the shirts and all those things. And um, they also present with uh, gait and balance issues. Um, as I told you before, like in uh, uh, paraneoplastic syndrome, affects uh, the uh, cells of the nervous system. So it affects the condition, all those things. And it, they tend to have a bit of a balance issues and gait. So how they explain or how to... Um, complain to the therapist like it's like they feel as if they are stamping like you know they're walking on a washer bed uh, they can't feel the floor underneath and the risk factor uh, for peripheral neuropathy on uh, with cancer patient could be like combination chemotherapies when they use two different uh, drugs and if one being a platinum base they tend to get this one diabetes previous history of diabetes or diabetes or new onset of diabetes or any sort of uh, deficiency vitamin deficiency like vitamin E and B. When I say B deficiency, like uh, vitamin B12, which uh, is also a bit of a anemia where it shows like a, a macrocytic anemia where they tend to cells are quite uh, bigger in size and volume. And uh, yeah, so that causes a bit of a peripheral neuropathy as well. So it's very important for that one. Uh, it can happen with uh, other people as well if uh, B12 deficiency can lead to peripheral neuropathy. Management. 
So provide uh, walking aid. So the picture what shows on the right is the ankle foot orthosis. So we tend to give like a lot of the static uh, ankle foot orthosis uh, to go on the shoes and all those things. And um, walking aid is um, depends upon the patient. Like what you see here is a fit gentleman. But again, if an elderly patient who struggles with walking and uh, if they have peripheral neuropathy on both the legs, then please do give a Zimmer frame. Uh, like, you know, uh, use Zimmer frame and um, speak with the uh, home, uh, like, you know, check with the occupational therapist, do a home visit. So normally what we do here is like if the patient is having any sort of uh, planned treatment or if they're having any procedure in the hospital, the, uh, the physios and the occupational therapist, they do a home visit. Uh, sometimes OT goes uh, themselves or sometimes they do a combined visit. They check at the uh, property of the patient and then if needs any sort of uh, uh, like a grab rail to enter the main door or if the steps is too high, they give some sort of a uh, more to reduce the height of the step, a lot of things. So, and if they have uh, difficulty managing the stairs, they tend to put a uh, handrail on both the ends. Or if they're not uh, safe enough to do the stairs at that stage, then they plan to bring the bed downstairs and give some sort of a basic commode, those sort of things. Uh, give uh, always advice on proper footwear, appropriate footwear. When I say appropriate footwear, uh, it's always safe to give the uh, footwear with. Uh, heel support or sometimes like you know heel strap uh, so that's very important and make sure that uh, the footwear is of uh, correct fit with a soft insole so uh, because it all uh, as i mentioned before like they did, they're more prone to have also uh, like you know uh, skin lesions because of the um, uh, alter sensation and I uh, exercise as like you know we're trying to maintain the property of muscle and try to build it up as well so uh, just therapeutic exercise and refer to appropriate services. This one, like uh, mobility, that's where we come into uh, play. So um, I've discussed mobility, what we normally do at uh, different stages. Imagine a patient has been newly diagnosed and uh, you've got a referral always uh, and the patient is going to go for a chemo or any sort of uh, debulking surgery followed by chemo or those things then initially just assess for uh, pre-op um, status like respiratory status like you know check how good is uh, respiratory uh, mechanism is like whether how good is their exercise tolerance uh, teach them about the breathing exercises and relaxation techniques uh, post-op um, help patient achieve physical and respiratory fitness prior to surgery. If they tend to, uh, if they're smokers, ask them to reduce smoking and uh, try to build it up. Like, you know, uh, teach them, like, you know, if they are shallow breathers by nature, ask them to take a couple of deep breaths and a lot of things. And if they're obese, try them to uh, ask them to um, get fit and reduce weight and get physically active to reduce the uh, post op complications like uh, deep vein thrombosis. Um, assess mobility factors as well. That's very important because, like, it knocks down the patients after the uh, chemo and other things. They tend to feel very tired, so it's always better to assess the mobility factors. Like, um, check uh, whether they would need any sort of um, walking aid uh, post treatment, and also check their nutritional intake. So a lot of people, like, you know, um, so sometimes, like, when I say it's like, um, it's always better to ask. Uh, some patients, what happens? They have they have very good uh, very lot of preference. So uh, if they have uh, came on if they're not on proper diet, they tend to be bitter drinks. They, it comes in different flavors, like, like you know, and check for the flavors which they prefer, and then um, just let the. Uh, uh, I mean, we, as a physician, you don't do it, but you just tend to check it as well uh, because of the uh, holistic approach. Uh, the normally what the dietitian normally does is that they do a detailed Thing like what was your preference and all those things. Uh, completing initial assessment of patients' uh, functional and social needs, that's very important uh, from physio aspect. Um, so, um, I mean, a lot of people like, especially with the Asian uh, descent, uh, they like to be quite in, uh, independent rather than being dependent. So, uh, it's always better to uh, check their ideas and what is their uh, expectations. Um, home adaptations before discharge, uh, which I already touched and establish with patient and carers their expectations and goals. So check what they want and be realistic. Treatment, when they're receiving treatment, so when they're receiving treatment actively or when they had any sort of uh, surgery in the post-op, then uh, you see them on the first day, try to um, see there's no, um, like, you know, um, like, 
repetition circuit exercises uh, some sort of a static uh, thing to keep them going um, and also like a uh, common uh, chest physio to achieve optimal respiratory status um, check for the bed mobility and transfer abilities and progress mobility as able and always arrange for outpatient community outpatient uh, referral or follow-up or community-based rehabilitation if required like home visits um, and also advise carers demonstrate them and teach them what are the safe techniques of uh, assisting patients with transfers without injuring their backs if you're providing um, if you're called in or if you're seeing the patient at palliative care your main aim is to uh, i mean is to assess the functional ability of the patient at that stage and uh, equipments and check for the equipments required to maximize his function at home um, assess for the wheelchair and appropriate uh, pressure cushions that's very important as well so you don't want them ending having a um, pressure so uh, at the sacrum but again like you know i don't know um, if you don't have a like appropriate uh, pressure relieving cushion it's always better to change and uh, ask them to change uh, or transfer weight to each bottom uh, regularly to avoid uh, or to promote uh, circulation um, so you have to advise on those things and assess and provide static or dynamic orthosis as indicated see whether they need it and uh, educate the care i mean in this stage what happens is more with the patient you always work with the family that's very important uh, it's not only you work with the patient it, it, it's quite new for the patient as well as it's quite new for the um, family as well i've seen people like you know a young gentleman who a very young family like all of a sudden like you know he had a cancer it was like few cancers like pancreatic cancers like you know you just spreads you pick it up at the uh, stage four or something like that and then it's like you know the lifespan is very short it's a big mental trauma to the family and the studio and to the uh, patient and you can see like the little couple of weeks or a couple of months like you know he was uh, very active going using his car to work and all of a sudden like you know, he didn't even, he doesn't even have energy to raise a uh, cup of water or something like that so it's always like you know your role is very holistic so you have to educate the carers uh, and you have to work with the family as well the i mean the next one is osteoporosis so certain cancers like prostate cancer or breast cancer or gynecology cancer they uh, they, are, they are quite high risk for osteoporosis so be aware of potential risk when assisting and treating this patient group so normally what happens is like you know uh, i tend to see patients in the clinic like in my msk uh, sessions like they tend to have come with the back pain but if you see the past clinical history they would have had a breast cancer almost like 10 years ago or sometimes like you know a um, couple of years ago so they are discharged from the breast cancer part of it but they come with a uh, gradual worsening of low back pain. So my first thing is you have to be very careful. Do, do not start jumping into all sort of manipulations and all those things. So take the proper history and check it because they are more prone for osteoporosis. Uh, so the literature, the strong evidence as everyone knows like weight bearing and low impact exercise are quite recommended for osteoporosis. There's a strong evidence saying like physical activity when combined with healthy diet can overcome some of the side effects of the treatment. Um, it helps in reducing the certain risk of uh, cancers. It helps to reduce the risk of long-term side effects like hypertension and diabetes. The Department of Health in UK recommends almost like 150 minutes of moderate so it's very important, moderate physical activity per week. So when you're planning any sort of exercise that will make sure the exercise is enjoyable to the patient. So when I say enjoyable to the patient, like if you say, come on, do static course 10 times, 20 times, they get bored. So give something different. So uh, like, you know, we can just have initially stepping and very light aerobics. So, like, you know, use your professional judgment, make the exercises quite enjoyable and uh, break the sessions so that, you know, what we recommend is at least 10 minutes thrice a day. So like, you know, it covers 30 and into five days, like 150 sessions. So always break your uh, sessions, like uh, around 10 minutes in the morning, afternoon, evening, and make for five days. So just more physical activity is very important. The red flags, very important one. So uh, whenever you're treating a patient with the uh, history of cancer, not 
acute cancer. But if you uh, if you're working in the primary care, or I mean, most of us are like if you might have your own private practice, and if you're working uh, in private practice and you have a first contact patient presenting with the back pain, check the history, see whether they had any sort of previous medical history of uh, cancer, and then check for the red flags. Uh, any sort of undisciplined weight loss. I mean, it's honest in weight loss, like, yeah, um, not uh, like, you know, uh, they don't have any, uh, any sort of weight watchers on those sort of things. Uh, see whether they have any sort of na night pain, uh, which is disturbing the sleep, or whether they have any sort of constant pain. Few things will match with MSK pain, like, like a, it can't be, like, and it's not reflected, like, but again, it's a professional judgment. Uh, so any suspected metastatic spinal cord compression, very, very important. Uh, I'm going to talk about that one as well. And any sort of, so when I when you say about signs of cardiac pain, I just see whether they have any sort of uh, any changes in bowel and bladder habits, uh, recent uh, uh, bowel and uh, bladder habits, or whether they have any sort of stadial anesthesia. These are the very important things what you need to check for, and also see whether they have any sort of new unexplained symptoms. So the one of the main ones is the metastatic spinal cord compression, which we call as MSCC. It is an oncology emergency. So uh, it needs correcting at the early stage. If left untreated or missed, then it can lead to permanent paralysis below the level of uh, affected site. Uh, so it is more common on the thoracic spine and it followed by the lumbosacral region. So it's commonly occurs in patient with metastatic lung, breast, or prostate cancer and as well as lymphoma and multiple myeloma. So uh, it's worth checking, like, you know, if someone comes and um, again, like, you know, sometimes left unnoticed prostate cancer. Uh, if they come, I've seen a patient in my clinic, which uh, he was an elderly gentleman, almost like, um, I think it was almost like 70 or something like that. And he was proceeding with gradual worsening of low back pain, uh, which is not improving. So. Well, first thing, like, you know, you always think it's uh, arthritis and then, uh, but again, like, you know, uh, it goes on improving because if you see the guidelines for back pain as well, like any sort of non-radical back pain, you have to review the patient within four weeks to see whether there's any improvement in symptoms. If not, then you have to just start, uh, like, you know, uh, looking by, like, you know, uh, out of your box and see whether it's any sort of other causes. Any sort of back pain with, uh, like, with a, radical pain, then obviously you have to review them in two weeks time to see whether there's an improvement. So the science of uh, science which suggests of MSCC is like, like uh, any sort of new or worsening back pain, or any sort of radical pain, any sort of uh, new onset of the limb weakness, or if the patient has any difficulty walking. They also tend to have some sort of uh, alter sensation. They tend to have any bowel and bladder symptoms. They find difficult to uh, pass water or sometimes they tend to have uh, incontinence. Could be a single incontinence or double incontinence. And they also show signs of uh, spinal cord or cordiacona compression like saddle anesthesia, and I say saddle anesthesia like, uh, like you know, they can't feel the skin when they are washing the bottom or something like that. The symptoms suggestive of MSCC would be like pain. Uh, the previous one is a sign, and this one is a symptom. So may, uh, just know the difference, okay? So the symptoms suggestive of MSCC is like, you know, they have pain on the thoracic or cervical spine, especially on the site. So uh, it will be like a localized tenderness on the midline. So they tend to have localized, but not everyone would have uh, like any sort of um, uh, like a like a step a deformity or something like that until unless they have a very bad uh, thing uh, with the uh, spondylosis and all those things. Uh, but again, what happens is they have a quite uh, localized tenderness uh, on the midline tenderness on the uh, thoracic or cervical region, or they tend to have a progressive lumbar spinal pain. They have severe unremitting lower uh, spinal pain. And they also have, they, they complain to you about having the spinal pain aggravated by abdominal contraction. So especially like the main common, um, 
complaint would be like, you know, whenever they're trying to uh, open the bubble or when they're trying to uh, bend forward. So like whenever this is sort of abdominal contraction or uh, tension on the abdominal muscles, then it will cause uh, increase the pain because it flattens the uh, thing and it, push, it takes the uh, pressure on the cord. Um, and they have uh, night pains, which disturb the sleep. So this one shows the common size of metastasis, like where uh, different um, primary cancer can uh, metastasize on different other sites. So if you, for example, see uh, prostate, uh, like, you know, they tend to go to adrenal gland, bone, liver, lungs, and uh, melanoma goes to bone as well, and bladder and breast, they go to bone. So uh, they all present a lot of like MSK pain, so it's better to be watchful. Bone metastasis. So this is a common finding. As I told you before on the previous slide, you can see how many cancers they show. They tend to metastasize in the bone, like bladder, breast. You have the uh, kidney cancers, lung. Almost like, almost like uh, more than fifty percent, they tend to uh, metastasize in the bone. So the common finding in the, is that advanced cancers, particularly the breast, prostate, lung, and kidney. So the indication of bone uh, metastasis would be localized pain on the affected site. Uh, so if the patient has a previous history of cancer and if it's have a, if it's presented to a clinic with any sort of localized pain, um, just you need to be careful. So your aim is to maintain safe functional independence, especially this one happens in the air, uh, like, you know, it's a more advanced cancer. So obviously the patient will be in the palliative stage at the stay at that time. Um, so um, your main aim, the, your uh, your therapy aim should to, uh, should be uh, like you know maintain the functional independence of the patient, a uh, safe functional independence. So the risk and benefit must be considered in full discussion. Like you, know, you have to discuss about the risk and benefit with the uh, patient, his family, and the MDT team, and always avoid high impact exercises with these sort of patients. So that completes. Um, um, my uh, talk and I've added a few useful resources like what we normally give to the patients or other uh, health uh, to the family or to the other uh, health professionals. So uh, you can have a look like macmillan.org is a very, very good ex uh, I mean, website which gives a lot of information for patients. Uh, family as well as for health professionals. They have latest research is going on. Cancer Research UK, as one of the gentlemen was asking previously about the vaccination, all those things, uh, you can see like a uh, lot of the, what are the current research is happening here. So like you know, they have a session for, uh, I think you need to register for that. Once you, it's a free registration, once you register, uh, you can assess their um, resources. It's quite interesting as well if you're uh, yeah, keen to know what is the advancement happening on. Uh, with uh, certain type of cancers. And uh, uh, these are my list for the reference to my uh, slides, previous slides. So uh, now I'm, um, okay, sorry, yeah. Okay, so I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Oh, it was an excellent session, sir. We have Thank just you. a couple of questions. Is there any special play therapy for uh, pediatric populations? Yes, um, I mean, again, when it comes to pediatric uh, community rehab, like um, there are specialist centers here. Okay, pediatric phases they deal with that one. When you say they play therapy, all those things, like as I told you, like um, it's very important. It's a profound judgment of what high impact, uh, like exercises, if it's depending upon the type of cancer all those things and again if you see the, like you know um, the cancer is uh, there are a few cancers which are quite common in pediatrics like uh, like a lot of the uh, later ones so um, yeah next question what can be the preventive measures from the similar perspective especially in the case of pre malignancy I mean, um, from the physio point of view, like, you know, if you're thinking from the uh, from the physio aspect, the main thing is like, you know, you have to maintain the functional, uh, because it is going to, pro like, it is going to progress or if it's going to relapse or those things, but you have to maintain the functional abilities and you have to make 
them uh, make sure that they are functionally independent. Uh, so normally what happens is to answer this question, the patient uh, has to go back to work. Occupational things are very important thing as well. So over here we have uh, support groups like Macmillan nurses are there. They can discuss with the um, um, uh, work occupational uh, TRM like, with the work. They can go with amended duties or return to work. Uh, there are a few, lot of support things are there. So um, to answer the question, like if it's going to be like, if it's pre-malignancy, um, I told you like, you know, um, if there's metastasis, like, you know, uh, this is like at stage four when it's press everything. So as a phys from the physio point, the thing is like your aim is to keep the patients safe and simple and independent as much as possible to the end, till the uh, palliative stage. Make sure the the main goal is to be realistic, uh, patient-centered, um, safe for, uh, goals to keep the patient functionally independent. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more faculty has asked, can you share your experience on cancer patient while treating the patient when they come with common musculoskeletal pain, but uh, after you after careful assessment, you have uh, suspected to have red flag signs and referred back to doctors. It will be useful for us to for practicing. Yes, um, I, I, my uh, like in my clinical practice, my, most of my uh, patients are uh, MSK patients. They book my clinic with MSK, so uh, I can share a lot of things. Like you know, I had a lady like uh, um, like. Uh, She's, she was almost like 75, 75. And uh, she was complaining of back pain. Again, when you put back pain, it's quite a generalized thing. And uh, she was saying like the onset was gradual. There's no issue of trauma. And she was quite mobile, denied any sort of red flag symptoms. Nothing was happening. Like, you know, nothing like she didn't have any sort of red flags. And I said red flag, like, you know, she didn't have any sort of unnecessary weight loss or no volume bladder symptoms. No weakness. She gave. She was mobile. Maybe her uh, range of movement was slightly reduced. So uh, we start. I mean, I started with uh, basic uh, back exercises along with some sort of a pain relief, and uh, reviewed it in four weeks my time. And still, there was no improvement. She was saying like it's affecting how it was, like you know, not uh, getting. Uh, I mean, it was not improving. So uh, had to do um, like you know, request the like over here. I'm an independent prescriber, and uh, uh, like you know, uh, we can um, request all uh, blood test, all those things. Like whereas in back home, I don't know. I think you need to request the GP, or sometimes like you know, the clinician has to look in a wider angle, check for blood tests to see whether uh, there is any sort of uh, markers raised. Um, so ultimately, this particular lady had a, a bowel cancer. So the thing is, like, uh, if you this is what the nice guy is, I can add those links as well. If anyone, if you're seeing anyone, if it's not improving, review them. And uh, you think it, it's not due to any sort of MSK, if you think there is an answer, like, if your uh, if your therapist or if a therapeutic uh, treatment is not effective or it's not showing any sort of spine, it's always better to uh, read a friend, make sure medically uh, other things have been ruled out. Thank you, sir. So, what can be the preventive? Uh, sorry, sir. What is your opinion about hydrotherapy and aerobic exercise for treating cancer patient? And at what oh, stage is it safer? Uh, I mean, um, see, hydrotherapy. Uh, it, it you have to be uh, see. I mean, it's, it depends upon which stage. Okay. Uh, you want to uh, introduce those things. If the patient is like, you know, there are patients like, you know, they're medically fit and they are uh, discharged and then you are working on them. Yes, you can, if they're safe enough to get into the pool, like, yes, you can get them and do those things. But uh, again, like, it's your professional judgment. Like, you know, uh, I mean, if they, I mean, there are a few contraindications. Uh, if you're going to use hydrotherapy for like any sort of op uh, open wounds or if they have incontinence, other issue, like, you know, you can't get them in because they're going to contaminate the pool and uh, it's infection for others as well. So uh, again, saying so, uh, like, you know, they can be used with, um, um, like you know, uh, catheters, and we can use that one as well. Or sometimes we can drain it and do it. We, we have done people uh, use hydrotherapy here, uh, but mostly, like you know, if you're going to be uh, doing it, uh, it is like in the later stage. 
uh, this, what I'm saying is like you know, the medical fit. So now what, what happens is normally they tend to be in vacuum and then they go on to bed units or if they're safe enough to go home, they go to a uh, home and then we see the community and once they're fit and they regain their uh, baseline, uh, then they introduce uh, into other therapies as well. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, nanotechnology or stem cell technology, which is more beneficial in physiotherapy perspective point of view? I mean, my thing is it's nothing to do with physiotherapy. So, nanotechnology, stem therapy, like, you know, it's a treatment thing. But uh, again, like, you know, uh, the, that's what I told you. Like, we as a physio, we tend to address the symptom <laughs> pathway of, like, you know, related to, um, um, like, you know, how you want to get them functionally independent. So, uh, which nano or stem, uh, like, you know, it is out of my aspect. So, uh, probably, like, if anyone is interested, I can sign both you to my colleagues. Thank you, sir. Just uh, two more questions from a YouTube live session from students. Yeah. Uh, is any evidence about TENS is safe in cancer treatment? Sorry? TENS. Give me TENS. TENS, TENS. Yeah. I mean, TENS, as I told you, I just put on a slide as well. We can use TENS, but again, uh, you can't use any sort of electrotherapy uh, on the uh, cancer sites, like, you know, that, like, you know, if it's going to be on the uh, primary or secondary site, you have to avoid those things. For example, like if I'm saying, like you know, um, you, you, uh, we, we tend to use uh, tens. Yes, we give. Uh, pay, for example, like if they have um, back pain or uh, like we used to use them, but again, like you need know, to be very cautious in using. And it is other electric mortalities are contraindicated on the primary or secondary site of cancer, so it's better to avoid on primary or secondary sites. Thank you, sir. So participants, uh, kindly pin your registered name and email ID to receive your certificates. Any more questions from the participants? I hope I asked everybody. Everything is clear now. And, uh, thank you, Dr. Shyam. Uh, thank you. For sharing your valuable time with us uh, to, to at the uh, weekend, and uh, you are sharing your time with us, really good and great. I think you are very hard on all the members and students. You are from the part of the world. Sham, 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 I'm Bharti. Sham, I'm Birka Pa. Sham Bharati, uh, madam. Uh, hello, Bharati, madam. I'm checking it. I'm fine. How are you? Nice presentation, pa. Uh, thanks, madam. Thank you. I'm here. 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 Nice presentation. Very nice. Thank you. You're covering everything. Mm, yeah. Thanks, madam. Yeah. OK, OK. Is it, done? Is it done? OK? Yes, sir. Any, any, more, any information to be passed to the participants? Like, Dharni, once again, you please announce the information, Dharni. Participants, kindly pin your registered name and registered mail ID to receive your feedback forms. So please don't share the link for the feedback forms to your friends who have not attended. It is taking so much of time for us to resolve the same. Kindly, please do cooperate with us. I think we will all join hands in this issue. Thank you so much. Uh, Yorani, once again, if you want to take the grid view photo, you can just do it just now. Yes, sir. Dharni will do it, sir. Yes. No, let, let us not waste our time because uh, Dr. Sham has got some more work to do. Sure.